Rick Bell once again uh, from work for, with Workforce from the Unleashed Conference, and I'm here with Catherine Minshew, CEO and found, co-founder of The Muse. Catherine, I got to start out showing you something. So, I so I oh, you yes. you gave me this <laughs> when I was in, in 2016 at the HR Technology oh my Conference. I love. It looks good. It looks yeah. good. You should wear it. I do. Put it under your suit. Heck okay. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. So yes. So. Is, is, is this Employer still? Employer branding. Is this, we, we don't print this on t-shirts anymore, but I think it still, I think it still works. Yes. Well, anyway, so yeah. That's so I, funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, 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 believe me, it's, it's been used. So, <laughs> so I, 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 well, first off, I need to thank our, our sponsor, BetterUp, for uh, allowing us to do the live stream here from Workforce. And again, we are the premier media sponsor for the Unleashed Conference here in fabulous Las Vegas. Amazing. It seems like we're here every year, huh? I was going to say, you can't escape Vegas. No, we can't. We can't, can we? So uh, the topic of your talk a little bit later is, is uh, it caught my attention. It's like how companies should adapt to work becoming human. Mm -hmm. OK. Work becoming human. Define that for, for me. I think it's about bringing the best of communication and relationship building back into the workplace. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, all of us remember the kind of classic job boards where you search for a job, you get 5,000 results, and they're just blocks of text about what you as a candidate might have, nothing about the employer. I think now I'm really excited to see a lot of employers are showcasing photos, videos, information about their employees. You know, you might, um, if you're looking for an engineering job, be able to click on a video of someone who works in that same engineering team who's geeking out about some sort of code they wrote or something that they did. Like That to me is very human. It speaks to the why of the job, not just the what of the qualifications. And I think that sort of, um, that sort of example, variations of that are being replicated across the job seeker experience, the candidate experience, and the employee experience when companies are realizing that by treating people as humans, not as cogs in a machine, you can actually create much more satisfied, productive, engaged hires and employees. And I'm really excited about that. Well, okay, so that kind of brings us, and we see AI all around us, right? How does that play into making this a more human process? Yeah, well, I think there can be too much technology in the workplace, right? I, I love the balance of, um, of sort of the, the, the human elements and technology that makes it more scalable. So I think it's fantastic when you think about companies using AI or let's say a chatbot to answer basic candidate questions, like uh, when their interview is, where they're meeting people. But I think when you completely abdicate the recruiter element of you know that person-to-person -person relationship, you're not gonna be as successful as someone that thinks about technology as an assist, not as an end game. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big believer um, in processes where technology can make human interactions more scalable, maybe automating something very transactional so that your team has time to focus on more strategic or more relationship-based issues that only a human can do, but not when people try and take processes that should be handled by a human and just kind of force them into uh, force them into a process. I mean, we all know how frustrating it is when you call customer support and you just get an automated message over and over again. I think we've got to let people get past that and really uh, relate to each other as people. Yeah, well, and, and so again, I, I, I guess with, with AI, it, 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 is that something that you guys utilize a lot with the Muse? Um, not, uh, not a lot, I would say. I think we're, you know, we, we use a wide variety of cutting edge technologies to collect employee content and data at scale to help companies um, really tell a more authentic and genuine story. We do a lot of work through, um, you know, both through themuse.com and people using it. We have 7 million people a month who use the Muse today, but also, um, uh, you know, going into the, the candidate experience and powering company career pages. But I would say we integrate with companies that use AI, but I think right now there's a lot of potential but the actual results are still quite spotty in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah. And so um, we use, again, we use technology to amplify humans, not to replace them. Mm -hmm. All right, so you are, what, eight years, nine years? Seven into, years. Seven years into the Muse. Yeah. Okay, has the Muse evolved in the way that you sort of thought from, what, back in 2011? Yeah, um, it has. And, and you know, it's funny, I think the, the mission and the goal of why I started the company has remained remarkably similar, but how we actually do that has changed dramatically. Mm. So the original idea for the Muse back in 2011 was uh, I had been job searching, I was infuriated by how transactional and just how frankly like bad the experience was for a job seeker. And I thought like, there's gotta be a better way 
to create this like immersive, beautiful job seeker experience that gives them all the information they need, but also helps employers be part of that conversation by telling a story about why their sales jobs or their operations jobs or their engineering jobs are different from all the other ones out there. And so that's pretty much what we do today. That's been consistent. But how we do it is, is yeah, has changed a lot. So we used to just interview people, talent leaders or CEOs at companies about their company culture. Now we can tap hundreds of thousands of employees at scale to generate uh, employee content. Um, we, uh, you know, we used to have a fairly amateurly designed website. Uh, we've been, you know, integrating the core and kind of updating the core technology to make sure that you can find what you want on the Muse. Uh, but I do think we're still at the beginning, and I hope that if we, uh, you know, we're we're here chatting again in two, three, four, five, or seven years. I need a new T-shirt. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll by, get then, you. by then, I'll by need then, by then you'll need many new T-shirts. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I hope that that the the mission and the theme is the same but that we've continued to iterate on how to achieve that in even more creative ways. Okay, so when you founded The Muse, uh, it was a very de different economic time. Um, yes. What's different today about job hunting? Because obviously we're in a flush economy. Um, there are more jobs than there are candidates versus 2011 when we were just coming out of the recession. Yeah. So talk about the differences. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely more of a candidate's market today. Uh, I said earlier on stage in my talk that um, apparently there are five open engineering roles for every single engineer looking for work. So it is incredibly competitive, especially for certain fields, technical roles, data science roles, um, sales roles, frankly. But um, I, I think that there's also just been a change in the balance of power, and I don't think that genie is going back in the bottle. I think that... Um, now, you when, know, you say, when you say... Balance in power, meaning? I think the balance of power between candidates and employers have shifted. Gotcha. I think it used to be that candidates had to, to hustle to get a job, that all the power was in the, or most of the power was in the employer's hands, and that, um, you know, if you liked your job or you felt like you were sold a false bill of goods, there wasn't a lot that you were going to do about it, except maybe leave. Today, not only are candidates voting with their feet, and they're more mobile if the work environment isn't what they felt like they were promised, but there are a wide variety of tools, be it you know Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, review sites, where people are talking. And I think you know it's not all constructive, but it does mean that employers need to think about uh, what it is that they're sharing. Mm -hmm. I also think that we've, as a as a culture, as a as a workforce, we've changed our idea of what is a great place to work from this kind of very static. Um, you know, you can all imagine the sort of corporate uh, 1990s type environment. Now, you know, for a while it was like, oh, Google or a tech company, that's the best place to work. But now I actually think we're moving beyond that to a much more individualized sense of understanding as, as a person, what are your values? What's your work style, your communication style, your preferences? Do you want a highly stable environment or one with lots of change? And then go find that. It's not some mythical, you know, promised land, the best company. Uh, we don't even do best company to work list because I think that's... Yes, saw myself there. You can say um, that. All right, good, good. That's good to know. We're all adults here. Okay, but um, no, I, I think that there can be great companies, but they're never going to be great for everyone. Right. And uh, and I think that's a good thing. You know, yeah, and that's no, a good thing. You're, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and so, are are employers really starting to understand that they have to cater? Is that a word? Is that the yes. right word? I mean, I, I think, you know, the challenge with cater is I don't think that the employee is always right either. And I don't think that uh, this new world means that employers have to bend over backwards to cater to every single expressed desire or need of their employee base. But I do think it's about thinking about the relationship as more of one of equal footing. You know, n not the employer dictating the demands, take it or leave it, but also not the employee dictating their demands and, and the employer cowering. Yeah. It's how do we um, create a relationship that feels like it's respectful of employees, that we're covering their, their basic needs, that ideally we're creating an environment where people have you know, learning and growth, um, but also that we're getting what we need as employers out of it. And so I think that kind of balance, again, it's, it's why I'm interested in this concept of fit or alignment, because what that looks like is going to be different for different people in different workplaces. But now that wasn't necessarily the case when you started the Muse. Fit was not, or, or was it? You know, um, we didn't use the language, but I think I think the concept has always been important to me. When I look at my own career, right? Um, so I grew up in Washington, D.C. I thought for seven years that I was going to be a, a diplomat or a CIA officer. Uh -huh. And uh, I, you know, I, I learned French fluently. I spoke Turkish. I made all these decisions. And I finally had a chance to work at a U.S. embassy in 2007 and realized, like, 
oh my gosh, this is nothing like what I imagined it. Surprise, surprise. Um, but even then, I, I think I realized like this could be a great career for some people, but not for me. And then I worked at McKinsey as a management consultant. Fascinating, I learned a ton. Also a great career for some people, but ultimately not long-term for me. And so even though we weren't using words like fit or alignment, I think from the very first days of the Muse, I was really fascinated by how do you tell a story about what a company is going to, uh, is like to work for that will let some people say, heck yes, that's what I want, and other people be like, ah, don't think that's for me. And that's great, that's amazing. You want those people to say that before you hire them, and then they're just kind of unhappy. Uh, so, okay, okay, so we're, we're you know, kind of going back to culture. It's just like we're okay. also experiencing a different political and social climate. Has the Me Too movement changed the way job seekers look at workplaces? Yeah, absolutely. Or is it too early to tell? Um, you know, I'm sure that we're going to get more data as time goes on, but already I think we're seeing an impact in how job seekers think about gender, about equity and equality, and about diversity and inclusion more broadly. And so what's interesting is, you know, I think that um, we've been talking as an industry about DNI for a long time, but one of the things that I'm starting to see, and we see this both in data on the Muse as well as in focus groups, in conversations with job seekers, is that uh, people are really prioritizing it. And it's not just women in this case, or, or, or people from, um, you know, a, a different background. It's straight white guys who are saying, I want to work at a company that treats everybody equally, that's respectful, um, and I'm going to vote with my feet if that's not you know, what's offered. And so I think that the pressure on employers to take this seriously, to not just you know do the figurative, like put lipstick on a pig and say, oh yeah, we care about this. No, I think that employers are starting to realize if we don't actually solve this problem or at least really try, um, we're going to be left behind. But I will put one caveat, which is we found that employees feel very deceived if an employer pretends that they're great at diversity and inclusion and they have it all figured out and people show up and they're not. It's actually a more compelling proposition for employees and, uh, and, and for hiring to say, hey, for example, we haven't historically been as diverse as we should have been and we are working to change that now and we want people to join us who care about working to change that and, and really letting people know that it's a journey. Now you still have to back that up with action, but you're not bringing them in the front door saying, oh, it's perfect, and then they, they show up at the party and it's like, actually we really have a long way to go. And a lot of companies have a long way to go, but that's okay. If you're genuinely moving in the right direction, learning, listening, working towards it, I think people will be on that ride with you, but they have to see the commitment's genuine, and you have to be honest about where you are and where you're going.